Everybody online, thank you so much for being here. For everybody in the room, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a powerhouse uh, group speaking to us today. Um, I'm really excited that everyone is here. Um, my name is Cinnamon Moffat. I'm the research program manager here at Hatfield, and I will be your host. For those folks that are online, um, please put in your questions into the chat at any time, and we'll be working through those at the end of today's presentation. Um, or you can put raise your virtual hand and our tech sauna will help us figure out how to uh, unmute you and you'll be able to ask your questions that way. For folks in the room, you've all kind of done it. You're signing in. Thank you very much for that. Um, if you have a question for us at the end, please either raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic or you can go to the mic stand and ask your question that way. That way the folks online can hear your questions and we have a good hybrid event that way. Um, wanted to make a couple of quick announcements, uh, letting everybody know tomorrow we have a student defense in this room at 10 o'clock. Kelsey Sueca is going to be talking to us about the influence of regional oceanography and the distribution of larval fishes. So we encourage you all to come back for that. Next week's seminar, um, we also have a student, uh, Rebecca Mosto, who did the beach grass study that some of you might have seen outside of the MSB building um, in the white bags. So she's going to come and talk to us about her research and her results. So that is next week. Um, but for today and why everyone is here and for those folks that are online, we have the COSY team. Um, that's uh, some folks that you might have seen on the last Oregon Stater. Um, yeah. <laughs> very beautiful photo um, and they're here to talk to us a little bit about their work um, there are several of them in this team but we have two of them here to speak with us today so we have lee torres um, who works with oregon state extension oregon state sea grant extension um, she is an associate professor in the department of fisheries and wildlife and conservation sciences she leads the gem lab with the marine mammal institute and is a pi with the cozy team that uh, is endlessly curious about uh, zooplankton prey and gray whales in oregon we also have suzanne brander who is an assistant professor in eco toxicologist with fisheries wildlife and conservation science department and the coastal oregon marine experimental station Brander studies the impacts of the aquatic pollutants and oversaw the processing and chemical identification of the microplastics from the zooplankton sampled in the study. So I'm gonna hand it off to these two and they're going to use this mic and turn that one on for us. Great. Thank you, Cinnamon. Okay, hi. Right. I'm Lee, so like Cinnamon said, this is a team effort. So I wanna acknowledge our other team members besides Suzanne and I who are gonna be doing like a pass the mic thing today. Um, so we got Sarah Henkel in the house um, and then Kim Bernard is on her way to Antarctica at the moment. Um, so she's a bit far to answer any questions, but we'll try our best in her stead. And then we have Lisa Hildebrand who is also in the house and she is my PhD student currently, but she worked on this project part of her master's as well. So it was a team effort. And I wanna start by thanking the Agricultural Research Foundation at OSU that helped coalesce and bring this great cozy team together. Um, you can see we <clears throat> come from a lot of different departments and across the university, and that's part of our strength, I would say. So to introduce myself a bit, so myself and my team, we study, my students and postdocs, we studied gray whales here. A little bit, keep talking. Oh, okay. Um, right, so we study gray whales off the coast of Oregon um, and doing a lot of different things. Something's happening. Can we... Stand by. All right. So like I was saying, we study gray whales here. And one of the things we do when we're out studying gray whales is we drop GoPros off our boat. So let's jump right in the ocean and see what we see in one of these GoPro videos. So this is taken right off the coast here, probably around your Quinn ahead. Um, and as you can see, it's a really shallow habitat, um, lots of rocky reef, lots of kelp, lots of crevices that the GoPro falls into. So you can see um, why it would be a hard place to sample for zooplankton, which are all those little fuzzy bug things in the way. 
um, which is what the whales love and why they're there is to try to get a mouthful of all that zooplankton. Um, so we wanted to understand more about what they're eating here and which was the premise for why, um, <clears throat> why this um, project started. Okay, so a little bit, just a small primer on gray whales. So most gray whales, they, well, all gray whales in the Northeast Pacific, they feed in the, uh, feed, sorry, they winter in the lagoons of Baja, Mexico down there. And most of them then migrate north um, to their summer foraging grounds in the Bering or Chukchi Seas or the um, Beaufort Seas, where they feed mainly on benthic amphipods. But a small portion, only about 250 gray whales don't make that full migration and they summer in the Pacific Northwest between Vancouver Island and Northern California, more or less. They're called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group. And that's the whales that we study here during the summertime. So gray whales are unique um, to all other baleen whales because they have a benthic suction feeding um, method of feeding. And so because of that, they often um, siphon up a lot of the benthos as they're feeding um, along the bottom. And as you can see in this drone image that was taken right off here off the coast of Oregon, they are sifting through quite a lot of sediment when they're feeding in order to get their prey mouthful. So, and this is true even when the whales are feeding in these kelpie habitats, as you can see from this other drone image captured off Oregon here, is they're still like sifting through a lot of benthos as they're feeding and they take that mouthful, then they expel as much of that benthos as they can. So here is a cool little video that we got lucky enough to capture during one of our GoPro drops where you can see a gray whale there on the right side feeding. <clears throat> and the video will play again. But what I want you to notice here is that even though we're right next to that rocky reef thing there, there are these patches of sediment around the, the reef areas where the whale will try, you know, there you can see it's actually scraping the benthos as it's trying to feed on some of that zooplankton or what's in the bottom. So again, this is just local, <clears throat> sorry, local evidence that the whales are feeding benthically and, you know, really have their nose in the sediment. Okay, so you are what you eat, right? So what do gray whales eat? And that was really the, the start of this whole um, cozy, cozy project. Specifically, our questions are what species are available in these coastal areas? What is the caloric quality of those zooplankton? And what is the microplastic load? And then secondarily, what's in the poop of these whales? Okay, so just to introduce our cozy team a bit more. So you have me here, which Cinnamon did a great job of I'm introducing already, so I'll skip myself. Sarah Henkel is an associate professor in the integrative biology department, and she's a benthic ecologist. She's also a community ecologist of zooplankton. Um, we got Kim Bernard, who's an associate professor in the CIOS, the Oceanography School Department or College, and um, she's a zooplankton ecologist. And then we have Suzanne over here, who's our ecotoxicologist expert. Um, and then, oh, right. So my job was to collect the zooplankton samples. <laughs> uh, Sarah helped with um, identifying species and community con composition. Kim oversaw the caloric content uh, assessment. And then Suzanne is our microplastic guru. Um, but I also want to give a big shout out to Lisa Hildebrand, who really helped integrate all of us across um, all of our little sectors of the project because she really did a lot of everything. So a lot, you know, all the other ones of us were like in our little sectors, but she really worked with all of us and integrated a lot of the work. So big shout out to Lisa. And then we also had a really great team of undergrads um, and graduate students across the board helping with many different parts of the project. So I wanna give a shout out to all of them. Julia Parker, Robin Norman, Noah Goodwin-Rice, Haley Kent, Emily Peterson, Kat Lasden and Jennifer Van Brocklin and Lisa, and then Alyssa Bloom, who we didn't have a photo of her. But it was really, you know, they carried the, the work of the project and, and that was a great part of the project. Okay, so let's get into the work. So we collected zooplankton using this modified water jug here. Basically, it's a light trap where we anchored it to the bottom. We, we would deploy it, you know, where we saw, um, uh, where we, saw zooplankton in these reef habitats and we put a light stick in them so you can see in that middle photo in the light trap there there's like a glowing green thing that's a light stick and we the an overnight zooplankton would be attracted to that and get trapped in the the water junk 
jug and then the next day we would recover it and have a bunch of zooplankton to analyze. So we did 36 of these light traps. We also did um, three opportunistic net samples where we would see crab larvae at the surface, which gray whales also feed on in these areas. So this is just the coast of um, Newport here. That's the jetty there. Um, and so you can see just the distribution of our sampling sites. And each one of these zooplankton um, samples that we would collect, we identified to species and reproductive stage for further assessment. For a fecal sample collection, basically it's, it's very opportunistic. It's when we're out there with the whales, we would look for this nice reddish brownish plume and zip over there um, as quickly as we could behind the whale so we don't disturb the whale, we let the whale swim away, but then we try to get into that plume as quickly as possible. And then basically we have nets that we just you know, swish through and try to get the best sample we can, <clears throat> which a good sample looks like this. This makes us happy when it's nice and chunky like that. Um, so, but in addition to the poop samples, whenever we catch, collect a, a sample, we also collect a blank, a water sample from not right in where the plume is, but somewhere nearby. And that acts as sort of to help us understand what the background levels of microplastics might be in the sample, as well as hormones. I should say that we also collect these um, fecal samples to do a lot of hormone analysis about the gray whales, but that's for another day. Okay, so, ooh, nope, let's go back to that. So this is a slide from Lisa's master's thesis, but it basically shows the process for how we dried out the samples and to create a pellet. And then we put that into the bomb calorimetry and out comes um, the caloric content, which is basically the energy per prey item. And so Lisa did all this hard work um, on these six um, different species where the primary different zooplankton that we collected right off the coast here. So you can see we have two different species of amphipod, two different mycid species and two different types of crab larvae. And so we conducted um, caloric content analysis of these six species. Um, and we use it as a proxy for what these gray whales probably feed on throughout their PCFG range. So these are species that have been uh, identified as prey items of gray whales across the area. So not just you know locally here in Newport. And then for comparison, we looked into the literature for caloric content estimates for um, this amphipod species, which is the uh, considered the primary target prey item of the gray whales that migrate all the way up to the Arctic. Okay, so here into some results. So does caloric value of Oregon coastal zooplankton vary by year? No, it does not. <laughs> so I should point out here that all these results for the caloric content that I'll point out for the next few slides were published um, by Lisa um, in Frontiers in Marine Science last year. Um, so no difference between uh, the caloric content of these species by year. But does the caloric content of these Oregon coastal zooplankton vary by species? And here we do see some significant differences, primarily um, with these two species. So one species of mycid, so Neomycis rei, and the Dungeness crab larvae, Megalope, had significantly higher caloric content than the other tested prey species that we looked at. Um, our last question here was, does the caloric value of Oregon coastal zooplankton vary by reproductive stage? And here we see that the answer is yes. For Homeomyces sculpta, which is another mycid species, we see that the gravid individuals, so the ones with a brood patch, did have higher caloric content than ones without a brood patch. So once we had these caloric values, we wanted to extrapolate um, these these values um, to the daily energetic requirements of a gray whale. So we used um, these estimates that um, were published in the literature by Villegas Alt Altman in 2017 that estimated the daily energetic requirements for a lactating and a pregnant gray whale. And what you can see here is that for each one of the prey species that we assessed, you can see how many metric tons a gray whale would need to eat if it only fed on say, um, on the lower, on the to the left, the um, Dungeness crab megalope or Neomyces rea. You can see that the amount of tons that a whale would need is, need to eat is quite lower than, say, if they were eating that um, amphipod to the right. And then you see um, to the far right that P 
PCFG composite prey, and that's an equal amount. It's sort of a, an average of all the different prey species, equal amounts of each one of those, um, because it's probably unlikely that a whale would eat solely Dungeness crab larvae for the whole six or so months that they're in this area. And then you can see on the far right is the amphipod macrocephala that the gray whales in the Arctic are assumed to be eating. So you can see there that um, the Neomyces rei and the Dungeness crab larvae have, you know, about the same, um, would require about the same metric tons of food as that uh, amphipod in the Arctic if whales only ate that <clears throat> to meet their daily energetic needs. So here is another way of looking at this same question, but now we're looking at the number of individuals a whale would need to eat of each one of these species um, based on those caloric um, estimates for the, each species. So again, you can see that if a whale could only eat Dungeness crab larvae or Neomyces rea, they would need a lot fewer individuals than, say, that porcelain crab larvae. All right, so now we're going to get into the microplastic side of things, and I'm going to hand it off. Thank you so much, Lee, um, and thank you again for having us present today. It's been an honor to work with this awesome group. Um, so now I'm going to tell you a bit about microplastics. So switching over, um, microplastics, of course, are something that um, you probably hear about daily in the news at this point. They're showing up pretty much everywhere we look. But regardless of the volume of research that's been conducted thus far, there's still a lot that we don't know, particularly about zooplankton in the wild. And this was really one of the first studies on zooplankton off the coast of Oregon and Northern California. Um, of course, zooplankton, they form the base of marine food webs. And as you've seen, Lee explain that gray whales feed largely on zoops and are at higher risk of ingesting larger quantities of microplastics potentially because what is known is that organisms at these lower trophic levels tend to consume higher amounts of microplastics than organisms at higher trophic levels, potentially because those plastics are small enough for them to see them as prey, or as a larger fish or a whale might not intentionally ingest a microplastic. And so the goal of this portion of the work was to assess how gray whales are exposed to microplastics, if so, how much, um, via, via the zooplankton-dominated diet. Um, and part of the concern about ingestion of microplastics, both for the zooplankton and potentially for the gray whales, is something called food dilution. If you're ingesting plastic instead of food, and that's taking up space in your gut or in your digestive tract, that can cause a sense of false fullness, and then you might not be as inclined to go after your next prey item, or it might cause reduced nutrient absorption. So lots of potential concerns that have been demonstrated in lab studies, for example. So what do we know about the ecological impacts of microplastics? We know that the size and shape of particles can be important in terms of how toxic it might be or how much of an effect it might have on the animal that internalizes it. And we know that fibers might be more toxic. This will become more important later as we get to the results. Particles can cause something called oxidative stress. And so a particle can um, cause cells to produce something called reactive oxygen species, which can cause damage to cells, can also cause damage to tissues if the effect is severe enough. And we already talked a little bit about food dilution. And just to kind of put it in perspective, at least in terms of the zooplankton, if a microplastic is something that is five millimeters or smaller, and frankly, most of what we see is more in like the 300 micron or smaller range when we're looking at zooplankton, average copepod is between 0.2 and 17 millimeters long. So a two millimeter long fiber is, is pretty substantial in size relative to the size of your, your digestive tract, if you think about it. All right, so what did we do for this portion of the study? Um, and some of these slides were put together by Jules Parker, who really did a great job of finishing up the identification of, of the fibers and finished processing a lot of the samples over this past year. And so, of course, there was the collection part that um, we just talked about collecting those zoops near gray whale feeding areas. And then we spent, what's missing from the slide is that we spent a lot of time sorting them by species. 
and decided to stick with three species that we had enough tissue for because we needed at least about two or more grams per species per sample in order to have enough tissue. We digested them and that means we put them in jars and chemically broke the tissue down and the carapaces with potassium hydroxide. And that's something we do for most sample types that we process for microplastics. You vacuum filter them through a five micron filter. So you're getting everything you can potentially chemically identify on that filter. And then you have the fun part of picking the suspected plastics off, which, which takes quite a bit of time. And the last step is that we use something called Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy to chemically identify a subsample of those particles. And that means you're putting it, each particle individually on a machine, visualizing it, using a laser, you get a spectra, and then you match that spectra to a library of standards to figure out whether it's plastic or potentially something else. And we did that for three different species. Whoops, I skipped one. And of course, a big concern when you're running and working in a microplastics laboratory is that microplastics are all around us. There are microplastics floating through the air right now, probably mostly fibers. And that's a big concern when you're processing samples and you don't want them to become contaminated because you want what you measure in the samples to be what came from the zooplankton themselves, not from the carpet in your office, for example. So we go through a lot of steps to make sure that we are only measuring what the animals are exposed to in the field. So we fire all of our glassware at a high temperature. We use laminar flow hoods to do all of our dissections and digestions, as well as the picking of the filters. And then we have background controls that collect anything that falls out of the air. Um, and then we subtract that from our total counts that we find in the organisms. So for FTIR, we identified a fraction of the microplastics that were picked out of those filters from each of those three different zooplankton species. And basically it's it's a way to identify the origin of the suspected microparticles. It's not gonna necessarily tell us exactly where it came from, but at least it allows us to identify what type of plastic it is or whether it's something else that might be not plastic, but is of anthropogenic origin. And a lot of what we find is sort of in between. It's not plastic necessarily, but it's a piece of wool or a piece of cotton from somebody's blue jeans, from somebody's laundry. So we find a lot of that too. And so these are just a few examples of items that we picked up from the zooplankton. So we found a lot of anthropogenic things like films, and this would be plastic. We found dyed wool fibers. So this would be something that would be of anthropogenic origin, synthetic. And we found things like cellulose too. And so the FTIR allows us to differentiate between something that might be a piece of a plant and something that might be from laundry contamination, for example, or some other source. And so this is just a table that shows the number of microplastics picked from each of our sample types. So we had zooplankton, and then we of course also had the whale fecal samples, and then the number of particles analyzed via FTIR. And since we had, so many fewer particles from the whale samples, we were able to analyze all of those. And we analyzed, um, I guess about a quarter or more of the zooplankton microplastics. And this is just an image of the FTIR that we use for microplastic and microparticle generally identification. We've started to um, call what we analyze microparticles in some cases instead of microplastics, because it really includes everything that we put into the environment, not necessarily just plastics. And this is just a diagram of how the FTIR works. So you have your source, your interferometer, your sample, your detector, and that's gonna process it, generates a spectra. And then this spectra, for example, matches polystyrene and so we match that to a library and we know that whatever we've pulled out contains polystyrene. All right, so getting to results. 
we looked at microparticles per gram, again, of these three different species. So A. tridens, H. sculpta, and N. rei, and found that there was on average about six or so particles per gram, although this varied between species slightly, there were no significant differences between the three. And what you can see here is that this is our average background contamination level. Our background contamination level was below the average number of particles we found in each of those species in all three cases. So no significant differences, but about six per gram, roughly across all three. For shapes, in comparison or similar to other studies in, in wildlife, we found mostly fibers in the zooplankton. And so as you can see here, we're breaking this down into five different shapes. We've got beads, bundles, fibers, films, and fragments. We only found fibers, films, and fragments. And fibers, as you can see, were the overwhelming majority in all three species. We also found some fragments and a small amount of film. And this is consistent with organisms that feed mainly in the water column or just above the water column. They're mainly getting exposed to plastics that tend to remain buoyant for longer or microparticles that tend to remain buoyant for longer and fibers would, would fit that category. And then for FTIR results, we saw that the majority of the particles we found were anthropogenic in nature, meaning they came from some human source that a small number of them in some cases, the most in atridons were natural particles. So maybe a piece of cellulose from kelp or some other plant. Um, and then a small portion were definitely plastic or synthetic. And in some cases, some of these anthropogenic particles also contained some plastic. They just weren't 100% plastic or we couldn't identify exactly what type of plastic they were. So the, the take home story is that zooplankton are getting exposed to a lot of my anthropogenic microparticles, a mixture of lots of different material types. So to put this in kind of the global context, thinking about zooplankton from the South China Sea, as you can see here, they also found that those zooplankton mostly contain fibers, a few fragments, so similar composition to what we found off the coast of Oregon. And we know from other studies that dinoflagellates, for example, have been shown to ingest microparticles. I know from other lab studies that I've done that other zooplankton like mysid shrimp and ciliates will readily ingest sorry, microparticles. So not surprising. And that microparticle ingestion can reduce growth in some cases up to 30%, which isn't, isn't a small amount. To put this in the context of what's happening in Oregon, um, there's another study that I'm part of. It's a collaboration with Portland State University where a student there is collecting seafood from coastal markets and grocery stores and examining the fillets for microplastics. And this work is just wrapping up. And what she's finding is that there are fibers in the fillets and that over 90% of the microparticles she's finding can be classified as fibers. So similar story, maybe slightly, slightly different part of the coast, higher trophic level. She's looking at things like Pacific herring, Chinook salmon, rockfish, link cod, and Pacific lamprey. But the species that had by far the highest amount of microparticle contamination um, was this pink shrimp here. So another, another crustacean. So looking at the poop contamination, and again, we had fewer samples here and there was a little bit more background contamination probably because of the sampling procedure, um, which we're going to try to improve on this coming season. Um, but we found um, about 30 particles per gram on average, um, it was a little bit lower in this, um, this organism here. So we had five different whales with all really interesting names like bean tip and equal and soul and soul too. And then we had for visual shape, you can see here that this differed quite a bit from the zooplankton. And so it varied a lot also between the different individual whales. And so bean tip had about 50% fibers, a little bit more than 50%. 
But for the other whales, it was more of a mix of things like pellets and fragments with a smaller number of fibers. So overall, they had different shapes and the plastics were also a bit larger in the whales compared to the zooplankton, maybe not too surprising. I'll show a graph on that in a minute. FTIR results were similar, but more variable um, between the individuals. Um, you can see we had, for the most part, the majority of those particles were characterized as anthropogenic origin. We had a few more natural. Um, there may have been some like, you know, chips of bones and other things in, in those samples and synthetic was also um, probably a smaller number for most of those. So thinking about microparticle shape, like I was saying, we saw a difference in the shapes of those particles, um, depending on whether we were looking at zooplankton or fiber. We saw that whales had a higher number of films and pellets in particular, slightly higher number of fragments, and that the average size of those particles was slightly bigger. And so what this represents is that the whales are getting a mixture of exposure from their diet, but they're also getting exposure directly from the sediment that they're sort of foraging around in. And most of it is probably unintentional. So we found that there was less fibers in the poop than the zoop and more film fragments and pellets in the poop. And so again, here we're looking at this, the three zooplankton species. Remember blue is fiber, um, lighter blue is film and green is fragment. And then over here, we're looking at the five, um, five whales that were sampled. And then just to kind of put this all in context, we did also look at the seawater that the poop, the poop was being scooped from um, in the field and found that the composition of the background plastics in the seawater did differ. Um, it wasn't exactly the same as what was being found in the whales. So that indicates that what we were finding in the whales was truly coming from things that they had ingested, not just from the seawater that it was sampled from. All right. I think this is where I switch back to you. Great. Thanks, Suzanne. That was a great explanation of the methods and what we found in terms of the microparticle um, load. So we have created this little schematic here to try and conceptualize these uh, microparticle results. So what we see here <clears throat> is that their fibers are the little squiggles throughout the water column. But what we think might be happening are that the pellets and the fragments are heavier and they fall through the water column faster and to the benthos. And so when we have a gray whale feeding on these epibenthic zooplankton or the zooplankton that aggregate around the kelp and reef, the whale is also ingesting higher amounts of those pellets and fragments that are in the water column itself, which you can see just that jar up there represents the blank. When we just take a scoop of water for our blank, we're doing it at the surface. And so we're likely then, this is our hypothesis, to mostly collect those film and uh, fibers that are more buoyant in the water column. And so, and then on the other side, you can see that when the whale defecates, you know, we sample, there's our net going through the, the the fecal plume, um, we're collecting, you know, both fibers and the fragments and the pellets. So this is sort of our conceptual um, diagram about what we think is happening and, and how, um, yeah, the microparticles are in the zooplankton themselves, but also in the benthos that the whale is consuming. <clears throat> All right, so the next thing we wanted to do is extrapolate these microparticle results to estimate how much microparticles a gray whale might be consuming in a day. And so um, I want to refresh your memory. So I showed you a plot like this just a few minutes ago, um, this one in the upper right. But we've limited this now to just the three species that we analyze microparticles for. So Attilus tridens, Holmiomyces sculpta, sculpta, and Neomyces rhea, and then that composite one that's sort of a, an equal amounts of those other three species. And so you can see that there's different to meet for this for a lactating or a pregnant gray whale. You can see that there's variable amounts of the number of individuals of each one of these uh, prey that the whale would need to eat. 
So the first thing we did was to use these, um, the, the estimates that we came up with through Suzanne's lab, looking at the number of microparticles per each species. And so the microparticles per individual prey, you can see here, but then when we extrapolate these out to estimate the number of microparticles ingested by a lactating gray whale, you can see we end up, and this is per day, you can see that the whale is eating a lot of microparticles in order to meet its energetic, uh, daily energetic requirements per day. So if the whale ate the most calorically rich species, that Neomyces rhea there, it would be eating six, about six and a half million microparticles per day, a lactating whale. And if we go now to see what pregnant females are ingesting, so these are the most energetically demanding, uh, uh, yeah, the pregnant females have the highest energetic needs. Um, if it ate a composite prey scape, it would be eating 13.3 million microparticles per day to meet its energetic requirements. So that's a pretty <laughs> scary number, if you ask me. Um, and um, just to put it in a bit of context, there was another study that was published last year that did something similar, slightly different methods, but they also estimated the number of microparticles that whales, so either Brutus whales or say whales, so those are two other species of baleen whales, um, feeding in the Haraki Gulf of New Zealand. So the Haraki Gulf is in a populated area just outside of the main city in New Zealand of Auckland. Um, and they estimated that these whales would be eating about three and a half million microparticles per day. So you can see that they have a confidence interval there and the max is about 10 million, um, which is lower than our estimate, but you know, not too far off, I guess. But what we think, um, is happening here is that first we assessed pregnant and lactating whales. So those are again, the most energetically uh, demanding phases, life history phases for a baleen whale. And also gray whales are benthic feeding animals. So again, they're, they're going through all that benthos where there's probably higher amounts of microparticles um, as compared to the pelagic diet of these brutus or say whales that mainly feed on euphosids or copepods. So again, just to refresh your memory uh, with this little schematic here about why we think the gray whales might have higher microparticle um, daily ingested rates, our estimates were higher than for these other two species. So <clears throat> in conclusions from our zoop to poop story, we found that there are differences in the caloric content of Oregon coastal zooplankton with different energetic consequences um, to foraging gray whales here. We did document microparticles in all the tested zooplankton species that we looked at. And we estimated that gray whales ingest high microparticle loads compared to estimates of other baleen whales. And our hypothesis is that gray whales are ingesting this high microparticle load from both their prey as well as their ben the benthos habit benthic habitat where they feed. So our final thought is what are the health implications of this microparticle ingestion for the gray whales, for the fish that also eat these zooplankton species in this habitat, you know, that's rockfish and lingcod, those other things that we as humans like to eat. Um, so these are our parting thoughts about that. And um, to conclude, I'm gonna hand it off to Suzanne one more time to take it home. Right, and so kind of wanted to zoom out a little bit and talk a bit about the implications. I mean, the answer to what the health implications are for the zooplankton and the whales are that we're probably looking, at least for the zooplankton, potentially at food dilution. And this is something we want to explore more in the lab if possible, and actually do some controlled feeding experiments where we measure what's happening with growth and caloric value of those animals. We know that with other species of mycids that we work with regularly in the lab, that we do see reduced growth after feeding things like tire particles or fibers in a controlled manner over a few days. So it'd be interesting to see what we see with the native Oregon species. And the jury is still out for humans, but some of the effects like reactive oxygen species generation that we see in aqua aquatic organisms is likely also happening in us too. We just don't quite have a, a solid understanding of that yet. But just thinking about plastic waste generation by industrial sector, and sorry, this graph is a little bit small, I guess much bigger up there. 
Um, you can see that packaging is by far the biggest generator of plastic waste. If you've ordered a package from Amazon anytime recently, you, you can understand why that is. Hopefully we can do something about that. But you can see here that textiles are number two. And so it's not too surprising that in our study and in other studies that have been done on aquatic species that fibers are above and beyond what we're finding the most of. Um, especially in organisms, that, again, that are feeding in the water column where they're going to be exposed to those more buoyant um, materials that tend to stay in the water column for longer. And so definitely the textile industry is aware that this is a problem and states like California are trying to pass legislation that would require filters on washing machines and dryers, for example, to try to reduce the loading of fibers of all different types into the environment. But really, this is a huge challenge. And we know that by 2030, emissions are predicted to reach at least 20 million metric tons per year unless we make concerted changes to um, our plastics economy and how we, how we rely on plastics, especially single-use plastics and, and things like fast fashion that generate a lot, of, a lot of microfibers. So I always like to end a presentation where we talk about microplastic pollution with some things that we can do because it is kind of an overwhelming challenge and hearing how many potential particles those whales are exposed to is, is a little bit alarming. Um, individual actions are definitely encouraged. I know, you know everyone knows to use a water bottle instead of buying plastic water bottles and to get your coffee mug refilled and, and all those things. But definitely voting for lawmakers that are calling for sy systemic global change. Um, Jeff Merkley, who represents Oregon um, at the federal level, has done a lot. He's sponsored the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, um, which hopefully will pass at some point. Um, but seeing from actions that are happening in, say, the state of California, it's clear that legislation is needed to kind of push the science forward. Um, and so things like trying to put filters on washing machines to reduce textile loading, tire particles are another big challenge that we didn't talk about today, but they're trying to find ways to control loading of those into stormwater as well. And just globally, this has really um, come to the attention of the United Nations just in the past year. Um, in February, there was a meeting in Kenya and they actually, the, the United Nations Environmental Assembly voted for a binding global treaty on plastics to be passed by 2024. So fingers crossed that that actually happens, but it was really exciting to see the momentum towards that. Um, and this action is definitely um, supported by scientists globally. So um, there's a lot of, hopefully a lot of um, action forward planned for, for the coming years on limiting, um, limiting our inputs of plastics and microparticles in general into the environment. And so we'll finish up there. I just wanna say thank you to everyone on the COSY team, um, co-PIs and all of the wonderful students that supported this work through, you know, through COVID, which was challenging, but we got it done anyway. So successful collaboration lots of student engagement, definitely multi slash, we're trying to figure out if it was multi or interdisciplinary, I'll say it was both. Um, and we're hoping to, to obtain some more funding to, um, to move this research forward in the future. So we're both happy to take questions. Thank you so much for attending today. All right, I'm going to switch mics because I'm going to hand that one around. So if you two can work with this, one, that would be great. All right, so uh, this is a chance to ask questions, but I'm going to start. Uh, Sana, do we have any online? So um, Mitch Vance is asking um, a several pointed question. Were the benthic zoop species collected or analyzed? Do the pelagic zoops ever bury in the sediment? And how many months per year are gray whales not pregnant and not lactating? That was a lot of questions. Okay. Let me um, start. Let me just say that again. So the first part was where the benthic zoop species collected or analyzed? 
Let's move on to okay, the second. Well, okay, well, the animals that burrow in the benthos were not. So the animal had to like, I was going to say voluntarily, but I guess so voluntarily had to get into the, zo the, the zooplankton light trap that we had. So many of them were epibenthic is what we call them, that they aggregate just above the benthos or around the reef kelpie habitat. But if they're a burrowing species, we didn't sample that. Okay, and the second part is do the pelagic soups bury in the sediment? No, not, not that I know, not these here. Okay, and third part of that question was how many months per year are gray whales not pregnant and not lactating? Yeah, um, so if a gray whale is pregnant, they gestate for about 11 months is the estimate. So um, females will, on average, in good conditions, I should say, like good nutri nutrition conditions, will have a like um, we'll produce a calf every two years. So they'll have a year as a resting female where they're recovering and then be pregnant again and they're recovering. All right, I think we have a question here in the room. Um, the, um, it, you didn't give uh, uh, numbers for plastics and the benthos, but I presume eventually you'll have them or they're somewhere. And is there any chance of using the plastic particles for some kind of a mass balance of how much food the whales are eating and where the food is coming from? And in the reverse is now that you know, have an estimate of how much food the whales are eating, do you have any idea of what the, say, water volume that they're having to process to get that much food is? So that you could actually get at how much of the prey population they're affecting. Yeah, so we don't have an estimate of what the concentration of plastics in the benthos is here off the coast of Oregon, although those are samples I would love to collect and process if we can get the funding to do that. And I think for a future proposal, it would make sense to add that as a sample type so we can get an idea of what proportion of the plastics are coming from each of those um, potential exposure sources. In terms of mass balance, that's an interesting question. I almost feel like that would be easier to answer for the zooplankton than it would be for the whales. Um, I think we would need to, I think in order to answer a question like that, we would also need to do analysis on a higher proportion of the plastics that we pick from filters because while we were able to get a rough breakdown of what the composition of the different particles were, um, we still, you know, to get a mess balance, you would sort of need an idea of the density of each of those particle types um, to get an idea and also probably better idea of, yeah, you would definitely need to know what the density was. And so we would have to get better identification for each of those particles and for a higher number of them. And I'll let you take the last one. So the last one was about how much water the, the whale's actually filtering through. So that is a hard amount to guess at. So, so they are based on um, accelerometry tags and so forth. They are and starting to estimate that and morphology estimates, I should say, for baleen whales. And actually that other, or I should say the other baleen whales, the rorquals. So that other study I referenced, that's how they actually did that study. They didn't actually measure the amount of microparticles in the um, zooplankton, they actually measured it in the water column and then estimated how much based on their lunge feeding and how many lunges they do a day. Um, those other whales, that's how much water they would filter. So for gray whales, because they feed in a very different way, that hasn't really been estimated. So without that under, better understanding of the mechanics and morphology of how, how much water they're actually ingesting, we, we can't really get there yet that way. Okay. Questions from online, Sana. Uh, yes, from Brett Dumbald. He has a two-part question. The first part is, he says, guess I should know this, but female gray whales are pregnant when they cross Oregon waters in fall, question mark, and lactating when in Baja only, question mark. Mm, well, okay. So, so what we think for gray whales is that they, they mate in about November-ish. Uh, okay, so Jim Simmons, November, November, December, anyway, but then they, they will come up here. I think when they're here, in the, when they arrive on their feeding grounds, they're maybe six months pregnant, and then they spend, you know, another, you know, four or five months here feeding, 
and then they will have their calf either a long route or down in the lagoons sometime January-ish. And, um, and then they'll lactate between January, again, come back up to the feeding grounds, whether it's here in the Arctic, um, and wean the calf around July. And so, um, so they are lactating while they're here, um, as well as on the breeding grounds. Okay, and the second part of that question was, is there anything known about the distribution of microplastics from Baja to the Bering Sea? Mm. <laughs> well, in terms of, there's spotty information, right? There's information, there are studies that have been done on, say, fish off the coast of California. There have been some studies done off the coast of Alaska on fish or water samples, but really we do need more data overall from, I would say, all major environmental matrices that animals are exposed from in addition to the animals themselves um, off of both coasts of, of North America. So I would say there's, there's some information and maybe enough to potentially compare what exposure would be in, in Baja, I guess, compared to um, what they would be exposed to off the Pacific Northwest coast, but that would be something I would have to look into. I don't know the exact number of studies at both locations. I would imagine there are more studies off the coast of California than in comparison to the number of studies off the coast of Oregon and Washington and Alaska. Okay, let's see if we have anyone else in the room. Thanks, Lee. That was a good presentation. I had a couple of, uh, well, a comment and a question. It seems like gray whales in these kinds of situations are actually acting like particle pumps, pulling them off the bottom and then feeding or pooping them out in the near surface waters so that they're, they're never really settling out of the system. They're continually being recycled up into the water column again. And I don't know how that might affect uh, your, your results in terms of the composition of the different kinds of, of microplastics. But the <clears throat> question I had for, for clarification was, uh, when you did the calculations for the amount of food per day, I think it was, is that for each day through a feeding season or is that a daily average for an entire year? I think it was throughout the feeding season. And so those are based on that Villegas paper where she estimated those, you know, for, I think, was it a six or seven month feeding season? That, I, think, I think it was six months. Yeah, those. Yeah. All right. Okay, so it was based on that. All right, yep. thanks. Thanks, Jim, yeah. So can you repeat what Lisa said? Cause she didn't have a mic. Um, those Villegas Umpton daily require, energetic requirements were, were based on whales that belong to that larger population, that ENP. And we assume that's the same for PCFG, but that is an assumption we make, but it is for during the foraging season. So that six to seven month season when they're feeding. Perfect, thank you. Sana, any other questions online? Yes, from Natalia. Do you study absorption of microplastics in diatoms? What origin of diatoms in the benthos, epibenthic or planktonic? It was about microplastics in diatoms in the benthos. Oh, so we don't specifically study absorption of, diet, of microplastics and diatoms. That was an example from another published study that we used to demonstrate that zooplankton are being affected by, um, by microplastic internalization, that their growth, I think that was the study where we talked about growth being reduced by 30%, um, but that wasn't from a study that we did. That was from a study from another, another lab. All right, any other questions in the room? All right, make me run for it. One moment, please, <laughs> going up the steps. Thanks, Cinnamon. Uh, I just actually wanna follow up a little bit on John's comment as well. Uh, given the amount that you have feeding per day, First, do you know, as far as your poop sample, you know, like what 
percent that that volume would be across the entire day or even of that one fecal plume event? No. I mean, so the size of the poops are highly variable and the amount that we collect, like the percent is also variable. It's probably not very much, like our percentage of capture is probably not as much. So, so there are biases there. Like, I don't know if what you're getting at is maybe that some of the heavier microplastics sink out quicker or things like that. No, actually, all I was wondering if possible. you could uh, then actually do a volume balance. And if, if you are feeding and consuming millions of particles per day, and looking at what is actually coming out. So then you should be able to figure out what is left in the whale. Does that even make sense in terms of, you know, magnifying out those little particles times millions day after day, how much would actually be in the whale over a season? And does that even, you know, logically make sense? Because it looked like seven particles were found in the waste. So, you know, it, versus millions going in. So it seemed like there's a high retention rate. Right, so I think in the poop, we found on average about 30 microparticles per sample of poop, but obviously per gram of sample of poop. So, I mean, I guess that would be the other way to extrapolate is if we could figure out how much grams of poop a whale poops out, how much they're sort of processing, I guess, is your, is your point. And then how much would be left in the how body? much would be left in and the whale over an entire season over a lifetime mm. how much is actually then of a whale is plastic right yes and we could try to do that that would probably be interesting compared to its body mass to begin with or estimated yeah yeah it's, it's worth thinking about thanks thanks for that suggestion thanks um, um this is kind of a follow-up question so i was curious about the results from the zooplankton versus the fecal samples and it seems like there are quite a bit fewer fibers found in the fecal samples than the zooplankton correct so i was curious your thoughts on whether or not you think that's because those fibers are being retained within the organism um or if because they were they could have been anthropogenic in nature and so were maybe being broken down in the digestive system and just kind of like what your interpretation of those results were in that regard. Sure, and just, just to clarify, we found a higher proportion of fibers in the zooplankton right. than in the, in the whale feces. They were being like retained within the whale <laughs> since they weren't coming sure, out. Sure, sure, no, that's, yeah. that's a really good question. That's possible. Um, we are seeing that fibers, we are seeing evidence of fibers translocating from the gut to fillets in seafood species. So that Oregon Sea Grant funded study with Portland State University has found across seven different species of fish. Um, and that also includes pink shrimp that the fibers are translocating to edible tissues. And so that's presumably happening in the whales too. It also explains why, you know, it, we calculate that they're ingesting millions of particles per day, but we're only seeing a smaller number of those in the fecal samples. And so it's likely that there is, um, there are some particles being retained either in the lining of the gut or they're small enough that they can translocate elsewhere in the, in the animal. So I'm curious about if folks wanted to get more information, is this information available where they can go learn a little bit more about it? Is it a, a website that we could share? I'm just wondering how many questions we still have and we're at our kind of our limit. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's a place that we can share for folks to be able to get more information. Well, we have a website for the COSY project on the Gem Lab research projects. And then I know the Pacific Northwest Microplastics Consortium has a lot of great information. Yeah, we also, I think on this, or maybe it wasn't on the last slide, I'm happy to provide um, the Pacific Northwest Consortium's website we also have quarterly teleconference for our consortium. This is a group that's funded by the National Science Foundation and is a group of about 200 plus agencies, academics, um, nonprofits that kind of get together to talk about different aspects of microplastics research. So we also have some information on our, on our website and then we're planning on publishing this soon, <laughs> soon as, as soon as we possibly can. 
And so um, that that will also be available um, once once it's out. Great. Um, so we're going to put that information into the chat for those folks that are online. And if they have follow up questions, they can find more information that way. For folks in the room, thank you so much for being here and uh, listening. Appreciate it. And we hope that you come back tomorrow for Kelsey's defense and next week for Rebecca's presentation. So thank you. And thank you, our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. I know. For everybody online, um, we've just entered that information into the chat, so you can grab that. And then we're going to end the meeting here in just a second. So grab that information now. Thanks, everybody. See you next week.